and I'd like to welcome you all once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This webinar is going to be on the development of toxicants and delivery system for feral swine. It'll be presented by Justin Foster, Research Coordinator with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. This month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated and is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Justin, with that, I'm going to pass the controls over to you, and you should be good to go. Okay, thank you, Clint. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, from the Kerr Wildlife Management Area at Hunt, Texas. Uh, glad to be with you here today, and looking forward uh, to discussing this important topic with you. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the research coordinator for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Wildlife Division Region 2, and the, my responsibility uh, in the region is uh, the development, implementation, and coordination of wildlife research. Um, for the last seven years, I have been fortunate uh, to be part of a wonderful collaboration working together to develop toxicants and delivery systems for feral pigs, which are impacting all citizens in North America. Today I'm going to talk to you about that effort, and as we get started here, I just want to uh, draw your attention to um, the host of of people, and they're not all listed here, um, that represent this international partnership. Uh, you can see there we've got folks from uh, North America, Colorado, Texas. We have New Zealanders, and importantly, we also have our friends, the Aussies. Um, I've titled this presentation, Development of Sodium Nitrite Toxicant and Delivery System Against Feral Swine. We're going to talk about the past, present, and future. Um, I talk about the past today uh, to show you uh, how much progress has been made and also to show you the diverse and talented uh, skill set of the members of this collaboration. Y'all will have to forgive me because this is my first webinar. I'm having a little problem advancing here. Um, our partners in this effort are the USDA National Wildlife Research Center at Fort Collins, Colorado, USDA Wildlife Services, Texas, and in the future, that may very well grow to USDA Wildlife Services um, in other states. Conovation um, is a producer of pesticides in New Zealand. Uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is a wonderful supporter of this and other important wildlife management and research needs. The Invasive Animals Cooperative Research Center in Australia um, is another university-based um, research organization. Um, and in this case, dealing specifically with the control of invasive exotics. And then we have Animal Control Technologies out of Australia. Animal Control Technologies is a leader in the development of pesticides um, for use worldwide. And notably, um, that organization and Mr. Linton Staples is very much counted upon by Australian citizens um, to produce very much needed um, rat baits, uh, mouse baits, in the event of plagues like we see on TV there in Australia. And our sister agency, Texas Department of Agriculture, um, not only are they the state regulatory body for the development or for use of pesticides, but they're also um, a long term and significant contributor to our efforts. So I'm very grateful to all of those mentioned here. Um, I hope I did not miss anyone. Um, a little bit about pesticide registry. 
Um, pesticide registry in the United States um, is is uh, regulated, or I guess you should say, uh, direction was given in the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Uh, this requires that all pesticides in the United States be regulated, and it gives the authority for regulation to the U.S. EPA. Um, at the state level, states are able to um, choose their own regulatory body, and in the state of Texas, um, that is the Texas Department of Agriculture. I just want to go ahead and say up front that there are no registered pesticides for feral pigs in the United States. Um, use of poisons to control feral pigs lethally is illegal, and there can certainly be stiff penalties for doing so. Um, as a wildlife biologist, my concern would be um, the unknown outcomes that result from the use of untested pesticides. Uh, that should be a concern to all of us, and particularly um, non-target and environmental fate is something that everyone needs to be thinking about as they're continually impacted by feral pigs. Um, I just was looking through some things the other day, and I'm going to call this gentleman an artist, um, but I would suspect that he has quite a bit of experience describing the path to registry of, of a pesticide in the United States, and it's it's difficult to make sense out of out of that picture there, um, because you can go um, multiple directions from many of those phases, and I simply use that as an example to show you um, what this collaboration um, and, and other pesticide developers um, may go through, and what we have been going through. The goals for our collaboration are the development of uh, safe and cost-effective feral swine toxicant. Uh, one of the things I like to highlight is that you know this is this team is made up of people who are concerned wildlife researchers and resource managers. So this this is not about uh, making money for those folks. The folks that are involved recognize the impact to. Um, native flora and fauna in their states, um, the potential disaster to economies, um, and, and the threat that feral pigs represent literally worldwide. Um, our goal is to in, con, increase control. Um, we want to see reduction of damages by feral swine. Um, with a toxin, it is our hope that we can achieve trans-regional application, specifically that the product works well in multiple geographies and habitat types. We definitely want to register the product with EPA. Justin, if you can hear me, I just lost <clears throat> I just lost audio on my end. Oh, now you're back. Except I'm not plugged in. Oh, that's okay. I can hear you all right if you want to just go as you are. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, I guess it's picking up the microphone off my computer, as long as y'all can hear me okay. Yeah, it's it's clear. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, our primary goal here is the registry of a toxicant for use in the United States. Um, our Australian collaborators are, are uh, doing the same with pushing registry in Australia, and that works well for all of us because we are getting an international perspective. 
Um, it's broadening our minds about the nature of feral pigs and the needs, the diverse uh, suite of needs that uh, could arise um, in, in different places. I can't speak for the intellectual property holders in all cases, but I am pretty confident that I can say every member of this collaboration um, either intends or believes that the first first use of any product registered uh, through through this collaboration with the EPA would be of a limited use nature, meaning that it would be trained applicators. Um, so, so you're not going to see a pesticide, even if it's registered on the shelf of your local ranch and wildlife supply for a long time. Uh, another one of our goals as as we investigate feral pigs and we learn more about them is providing best management practices for the use of any products that we develop. Um, taking you back to history, like I said, to kind of show you how this all came together and show you uh, the skill set and the resources, um, I will take you back to 2004. Uh, when the Invasive Animals Cooperative Research Center and Animal Control Technologies in Australia um, began to look at prototype baits and consumption by uh, different species um, in the Australian wild. Um, they were looking at target specificity of baits there. In 2005, um, you see that the USDA National Wildlife Research Center Texas Field Station um, partnered with Invasive Animals and Animal Control Technologies to continue evaluating um, which wildlife species, um, which non-target species may indeed consume a bait targeted for feral swine. Um, they were specifically looking at the potential for oral delivery of a toxicant through a fish meal based bait. Those same folks partnered again in 2006, again looking at potential consumers, um, all in an effort to try to understand risk um, to wildlife and livestock. Um, and at the same time, they were evaluating flavorings, if you will, in those baits to try to determine which one would be most attractive um, to feral pigs while reducing non-target consumption. In 2008, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department became aware of the potential for toxicants um, to control feral swine. Uh, we further learned through the publications of our Aussie friends that sodium nitrite had been labeled as the Achilles heel of feral swine for many reasons. And in our literature review, we, we saw that this may well indeed be the best option um, for increasing cost efficacy of feral swine control. So we began to look in that, into that. And in the beginning, our work was focused on how sodium nitrite deployments would affect wildlife in Texas. Um, we did that with funding from the Texas Department of Agriculture, and we looked at three species. We looked at raccoons, um, because in previous research, they had been labeled as the most probable consumer of a bait targeted at feral swine. They are a native species, um, so they remain important to, to the ecosystem here in Texas and North America. Um, we also looked at feral swine, and that was an attempt to replicate some of the work that had been done on swine sensitivity there in Australia. And then we also looked at white-tailed deer sensitivities um, because they are one of the most, if not the most, socioeconomically important species in the state of Texas. 
in 2010, In 2010, we began to see a, a larger and, and more formalized effort um, to develop and optimize feral swine toxicants for registry in the United States. So now you have all of the aforementioned players uh, coming together again and specifically evaluating uh, one proven delivery system, which was the hog hopper produced by Animal Control Technologies Australia, and we were also looking at different flavoring in baits here at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area. In 2013, that partnership um, further evolved. Um, we began to have a plan. We began to understand what we needed to do um, to to carry this out. And we began working on formulations of sodium nitrite, um, the palatability of baits, lethality, delivery systems. We began to evaluate animal welfare and also uh, non-target concerns. Let's talk a little bit about sodium nitrite. Um, this is far and away incomprehensive, but I'll give you just a few tidbits here. Um, some of the things that I've seen through time working on this project. Number one, it's not sodium nitrate. Um, they are similar in their effects on animals, but sodium nitrate is certainly much less much less potent. I, I think all of us in this collaboration would agree that the development of a pesticide, whether it be sodium nitrite or another active ingredient, is not the end of feral pigs in North America. I shaded that one yellow because I certainly think it'll make a big difference, otherwise I wouldn't be here speaking with you. Um, you may have heard that uh, sodium nitrite is not target specific, I mean that it is target specific physiologically. Uh, that's, that's a little bit of a half truth. Um, Feral pigs are very sensitive to sodium nitrite. Um, however, um, other mammals um, consume enough sodium nitrite, it could result in death, and it is certainly uh, toxic to, to fish and other aquatic organisms. Sodium nitrite's not palatable to pigs. You're not going to take this stuff in its raw form and, and deliver it to pigs. Um, from what I've seen to date, after seven years, it, it can certainly be very valuable for an integrated pest management system. And if I was a landowner in Texas and I indeed wanted to uh, do a better job of uh, controlling pigs and increase my lethal take of pigs, I would certainly want a pesticide and specifically sodium nitrite in my toolbox. Um, unless we, we find out through the registry process that it's not registerable uh, or, or there's some unforeseen um, attribute um, to keep me from doing so. Sodium nitrite is a very strong oxidizer, um, which makes it very unstable. It's been called an angry chemical by one of my colleagues. Uh, it's very difficult to stabilize. Um, Importantly, it is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, and it is simply just a yellow-white crystalline salt. One of the boogers about sodium nitride is that it's hygroscopic. It attracts and, and holds water. Um, it, it can literally degrade um, in areas of high humidity, and when it reacts with water, we began to have uh, reactions that, that would make it less potent, less palatable. So, so that's a difficult uh, uh, thing for anyone to deal with in terms of incorporating sodium nitrite into a bait. In terms of uh, caution there, sodium nitrite enhances the combustion of other materials. It's, it's not really flammable itself. Um, but when incorporated uh, in a reaction with organic materials, uh, this can cause 
exothermic reactions which uh, burn rapidly and produce a whole lot of heat. In fact, sodium nitride has been used uh, with other ingredients to make rocket motors and things of that nature. Uh, under, under the uh, general terminology of rocket candy. It's used as a color fixative. It has anti-botulitic qualities um, that protects us from bacterial in infection um, through consumption of tainted meat. Um, a lot of folks don't know this, but sodium nitrite is a great antidote uh, with combined, when combined with some other active ingredients. Um, for cyanide poisoning. It's used in dye production and all kinds of various industry like metallurgy. It is registered as a feral swine toxicant in New Zealand and I believe that was 2013 and as I already indicated the Aussies have high hopes of getting it registered in Australia. Um, in terms of how sodium nitrite affects mammals, I, I'm going to keep this very simple, and this is overgeneralized. But um, what it does is it oxidizes some of the oxygen-rich hemoglobin in your blood to an oxygen-poor hemoglobin called methemoglobin. Um, we call that condition methemoglobinemia. The results of methemoglobinemia are in coordination and respiratory distress. Um, we may see nausea and vomiting. Um, pigs will ultimately lose their loss of, well, mammals, not, not, not just pigs, uh, will ultimately uh, lose their ability to right themselves and will, will become unconscious and then expire. Um, it is reversible in that, uh, Insufficient levels for mortality are quickly uh, reduced um, in the mammalian body, um, and we'll get to that more in a little bit. Um, there is an antidote for sodium nitride intoxication. It is difficult to administer. Um, that antidote is methylene blue. If you look at the graph here on the left, you'll see um, that sodium nitride um, causes the onset of methemoglobinemia very rapidly. Uh, you notice there, by 70 to 80 minutes, we already see uh, methemoglobin levels at the 70% range. Um, anything under 70%, the, the intoxicated animal is very much likely to uh, recover and, and a full recovery. Anything over 70%, um, 70 to 80 percent, we begin to see death as an outcome, and somewhere above 80 percent, it becomes imminent. Some of you would like to compare this. Uh, well, now let, let me let me rephrase that. Um, why are feral pigs sensitive? And how does how does that compare to other species? Well, all of, all mammals have an enzyme um, in their body, and it's called methemoglobin reductase, and it converts methemoglobin back to other oxygen friendly methemoglobin species. If you look at this chart here um, from our Aussie collaborators you can see that the rate at which methemoglobin is reduced in the pig is much lower than those other species there. Um, seven times lower than the horse, 12 times lower than cattle, and if, if you look at humans, humans reduce methemoglobin about 11 times faster than feral pigs do. Now let's talk a little bit about the registry timeline as it pertains to this collaboration. On the left side of the blue line in this graph, which is approximately 2013 to 2000, through 2015, um, the, the formalized effort um, of this collaboration was underway. 
Um, you can see that we have been through those steps on the left side there with toxicant development, um, pilot pen trials, and then even collecting data to submit for the EPA in our lab efficacy trial. All the while, we are certainly looking at palatability and lethality and feeding behavior in terms of efficient delivery and feeder design. Uh, we're also beginning to look at uh, non-targets, carcass hazards, things like that, stability and fate. On the right side um, is where we are at today. Um, we have collected data in captivity that we need to submit to the US EPA in anticipation of what we call an experimental use permit or EPA a field efficacy trial. The review period for that, that data is up to 16 months. Uh, we are very hopeful that we will receive that permit, um, and, and I'm, I'm confident that we have a very good shot at it um, because our registry team is made up by folks at the National Wildlife Research Center and that they have much experience in registering pesticides. So I, I certainly believe we'll get that done. We are hopeful that the permit will be issued and that we could enter the lab efficacy trials um, sometime in 2017, and that would be free range testing in multiple states. After that, there would be another 16 months review process, and then we can move into state registration. I'm going to briefly highlight some of the observations um, from work done by members of this collaboration. Um, early on, we, we certainly observed that sodium nitrite is not target specific in terms of physiology relative to mammals here in the United States. It is toxic to humans, um, contrary to what you've heard. It's just that we don't consume very much of it. Um, the bottom line there is, is we've got to have a delivery system to deliver this active ingredient. Specifically, uh, raccoons are much less sensitive than both feral swine and deer, and deer are slightly less sensitive than feral swine. However, uh, I would caution anyone that deer are not in danger. Uh, we deliver sodium nitrite in such high quantities in those baits that I would definitely be concerned that a deer would uh, be in danger and expire from consumption of those baits. So this really highlights uh, the need for the delivery system. You ask, well, I eat sodium nitrite all the time in my bacon, in my ham. Um, why doesn't it impact me? Well, you're eating very low levels. Um, you're talking uh, 40 times the levels of sodium nitrite in a lethal bait for a pig versus what you're consuming in cured meat. In terms of palatability and stability, um, I mentioned some of the characteristics that uh, make sodium nitrite so difficult to stabilize and mask. Um, based on the efforts of this collaboration, I'm confident in saying that uh, sodium nitrite cannot be reliably delivered without pharmaceutical expertise. You might, uh, you might have an effect on one occasion and not an effect or a poor effect in an, on another occasion, um, all of this would certainly be impacted by uh, ambient temperature and humidity, um, not to mention the various beta ingredients that, that might react with the active ingredient. So what we do with that sodium nitrite is, is we uh, contract uh, world-renowned chemists 
and they protect it from both bait and environment with a process called micro-encapsulation. Uh, we have tried handfuls of, of different formulas to get this right, um, and, and we have certainly arrived at a few formulations that, that will stabilize and mask the active ingredient. We believe that target-specific delivery is possible. Um, there are a number of target-specific feeders which have been peer-reviewed and published. Um, the one shown here is the hog hopper. That device was tested in Texas and Louisiana, and it was confirmed to be target-specific and I highlight that that was not in areas where bears were frequenting. Um, that would be a concern to all of us, um, is being able to deliver baits to, to feral pigs, feral swine in bear habitat. I don't think we've got there yet, but I do think we will. Um, in the graph, the graph simply represents the number of max individuals in a single photo and also the blue column represents the number of baits consumed in a 24-hour period. You can see there um, that, that swine are certainly accessing and, and removing those baits uh, much more frequently than any other non-targets. And, and the only non-target that accessed those was raccoons. The, that access may have actually occurred here on the wildlife management area solely. Um, I was responsible um, during that evaluation for a few of those um, breaches, if you will. And I am fairly confident that uh, it was our methods that, that caused that more than it was the feeder. Our team has also looked at the strength of both raccoons and feral swine, um, essentially because raccoons are, are dexterous. They certainly have the ability to manipulate a manual feeder and, and get into bait. And so our team has specific, specifically looked at, at uh, the strength of those raccoons up at the National Wildlife Research Center. I believe that they nicknamed that raccoon Hercules, um, but they know exactly how much pressure a raccoon can exert on a device uh, to access baits. Um, they also led us here to Kerr Wildlife Management Area in a study um, that would uh, tell us exactly what feral swine, um, the amount of force that feral swine can uh, exert with their rooting behavior on a manual device. I've got a black screen here. And I wasn't expecting that one. Um, bait acceptance and lethality. Um, I, I feel good about this. Uh, it was a major concern to us because we're working in captivity, um, which is not a natural system. And thus we evaluated our non-toxic baits um, in both Texas and Australia, and, and we had good acceptance by feral pigs with the non-toxic baits. The toxic baits, um, we're also well accepted in Australia and New Zealand, um, though we haven't tested them in the field in the United States because of uh, regulations. Furthermore, in our captive trials, we achieved 93% mortality with an alternate, an alternate diet available. Um, the purpose of that alternate diet is just simply to give these pigs a choice um, to ensure that we're not forcing them to consume our bait. Um, again, we were very effective at 93%, and that is the data that's going to the US EPA. Um, if you see there in the chart on the lower right, um, the amount of consumption of both toxic and placebo bait versus the challenge diet was very high on night one. 
Um, that data further demonstrates that um, we certainly need to work on being able to deploy toxicants on consecutive nights and emphasizes the need for um, efficient delivery on night one when you transition from a non-toxic bait to a toxic bait. In looking at efficient delivery, we evaluated different types of plausible arrangements for deploying toxicants, wanting to find out uh, what was the best arrangement to deliver baits to the majority of pigs in a sounder. Um, essentially, those were small uh, um, captive trials of direct observation where we looked at these four different configurations um, and found out that a simple back-to-back -back design uh, was going to be the most efficient for delivering this product. We also looked at essentially the size. How long do these feeder boxes need to be? And what we found out was that we needed to make them at least a little over a meter long um, to ensure that all the pigs are dosed. And on the on the upper end of that, it's just simply a, a man. It's a it's a matter of uh, ease of use for the applicator. You start getting too long, and it's just going to be difficult to get the bait box in the truck and deploy it. Uh, additional findings in that work is that sometimes pigs are not as smart as we give them credit to be. Uh, we found that only about 50% of the pigs tested are able to manually activate a feeder box. We also found that 100% of the animals did access the bait and therefore um, there's still a high probability that they would be dosed. However, it does highlight to us that we need to work on our design to ensure that small groups of pigs or even individuals could access a bay at any given time. In our work, we, we observed that sodium nitrite was causing pigs to vomit on some occasions. And that concerned us because we knew there would be uh, some level of sodium nitrite in that vomit. And however grotesque or nasty that vomit might appear, it did dawn on us that uh, there is a potential that another animal would consume that. And then certainly we know based on basic biology and the observations that we've seen that there are going to be non-target secondary consumers consuming feral pig carcasses if they're left on the landscape. So we decided uh, to, to look further into that, wondering if we could alter uh, the vomit and or the residual amount of sodium nitrite in a tissue um, with the release side of the active ingredient, specifically whether it was released in the stomach or the intestine. Um, we did that through microencapsulation processes um, with our contractors. And unfortunately, what we found out is it didn't matter if we released the active ingredient in the stomach or the intestine, there was no reduction in the frequency of vomit. Um, we did find that all tissues, excluding the stomach tissue and its contents, uh, are very likely to be safe for consumption by non-target animals. Essentially, the, the nitrite is so dispersed 
um, and degraded through the reactions that it's been through in the GI tract. In our observations, we had seen that pigs don't always have synchronous feedings. Um, not everybody comes to the trough at the same time. Um, this presented a concern for us, um, especially if, if pigs are able to um, learn to avoid toxication, intoxication based on experience. Um, we were concerned that if if some pigs became intoxicated before other pigs had consumed uh, a bait that they might uh, literally avoid a bait station and so we uh, looked at uh, rapid versus delayed release actives um, to see whether that made a difference. Uh, we were also evaluating the clinical signs of the intoxication at that time and what we found out was was that uh, the rapid deployments were equally or more humane than the delayed uh, deployment or de delayed intoxication. Um, unfortunately, the delayed release seemed to increase the intoxication time and, and that certainly uh, doesn't bode well in terms of um, whether or not it is a humane intoxication. Um, or a humane death. The other problem with the delayed release is that um, pigs will certainly consume a lot more of the bait and this could make costs of control much higher because we're having to put more product out there. Next steps for this work are going to um, move through the registry, base, registry phase uh, we'll be looking at non-target risks, um, specifically pilot work we have done ha has indicated that we really need to take a good look at our avian scavengers in our um, black and turkey vultures. Um, they will certainly consume feral pigs and they will certainly consume uh, some of those, the, well, any of those tissues and, and even stomach tissues. So we've got to do a good job on that because our avian scavengers are, are very important to our ecosystem. Uh, USDA National Wildlife Research Center will also be looking at uh, coyote consumption and their sensitive sensitivity to sodium nitrite through secondary consumption. Hopefully we will launch the EPA field study in 2017 uh, in that study, we will be emulating um, an active deployment. We, we will do it um, to the best of our ability as we think it should be done were the product registered. It will be an interstate uh, study done in multiple states in different habitat types. It should give us some information about uh, trans-regional application and our target of mortality, uh, lethality in, in that work will be 70%. Um, in the meantime, um, environmental fate will continue to be evaluated. Um, specifically, they will look at uh, infiltration into soil, um, stability of the product in the environment, um, transport of the, of the product, um, things of that nature. Taking a look again at our registry timeline, uh, we're right there initiating the 16-month uh, review process for the experimental use permit. So it will very soon be in EPA's hands as to whether or not we are able to take this product to the field and we've still got uh, a few more years of work to go through before a pesticide would be registered here in the U.S. So to summarize a little bit what we've talked about, um, this collaboration is, is a, certainly a very diverse and skilled um, established partnership, uh, long track record together, uh, lots of resources there in terms of knowledge and manpower and facilities. 
we have confirmed that we can deliver um, baits to feral swine for uh, pharmaceutical purposes. Um, it appears as if sodium nitrite has a high degree of operator safety for those applicators that would be using it. Uh, we have no indications thus far to believe that sodium nitrite causes an inhumane death. We know from our experiences that we can stabilize this stuff so that it, it is stable enough to get it into a bait and mask its flavor and that it will be well accepted by pigs. Um, there are safe delivery systems out there and we are continuing our work um, to develop the most efficient one possible. The registry process has been initiated. Uh, we have made a major benchmark in completing those captive trials here. Those captive trials uh, lasted three years. Um, there was lots of failures and probably tested upwards of uh, 40 or so bait active ingredient combinations. Um, today I can say that we have one um, that is ready to submit. We have another active ingredient that has demonstrated a high mortality rate um, and would very likely be suitable in terms of bait acceptance and lethality rates. And then we have another one in the hole that is looking very well also. Um, we are taking a proactive look at risks, um, namely because every member of this collaboration has a concern for natural resources. Uh, we we would, don't want the indiscriminate um, take of, of non-target wildlife in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's part of our, our ethic and, and it is part of our charge um, in the organizations which we work for. And with that, I think it's time to start discussing this. Very good. Thank you, Justin. Uh, we had only one question so far, and we've still got time, so I encourage everybody who's, who's still on to uh, post up any questions you may have, and we'll get to them as we go. The first question is, um, how at risk are javelina to the toxicant, and does the feeder reduce their access? We have not specifically tested the sensitivity of Havelina with sodium nitrite. Um, that, that's a good question and it is one that has been on our mind um, because they are sympatric in many places. Um, Havelina may very well have some of the behaviors in terms of rooting. Um, however, um, and, and I, I address this in my graph, Havelina just didn't show up in it. Um, the hog hopper specifically uh, was placed in areas where Havelina is frequent and, and we did not have um, any significant uh, breaches of the hog hopper. So with that specific device, um, I would say that uh, Havelina are fairly safe and there are certainly other devices out there which we're well aware of uh, and that we've tested um, that that will certainly be considered as we uh, decide on the final delivery system for the registry. When you get to the field testing
Justin, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, my audio completely cut off on my end, and I don't know what happened. Um, we've got some more questions that came in. Um, the first is, will the field testing be done on private properties? Um, the USDA will lead uh, field testing, and I would say that it will very likely occur um, on some private properties, uh, possibly some um, state-owned public lands, um, but that will be at the discretion of the USDA. Okay. Um, what are the considerations for the large-scale disposal of carcasses? What are the considerations for the large-scale uh, disposal of carcasses? Uh, well, for, first of all, we, we would want to uh, consider nitrite levels uh, in those carcasses, which we have already begun to do. Uh, we would want to look, consider the degradation rate of, of nitrite residuals in those carcasses. How long do they persist? Um, that work will cert certainly be uh, uh, done as necessary. Uh, we would also want to uh, consider um, season of treatment and, and which species might be present um, or come into contact with those animals. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we, we, we would want to have a pretty good idea of, you know, how, how many carcasses are we talking about disposing? Um, you have to understand that that deployment of a pesticide or any other uh, control effort is not going to happen all at once. Uh, feral pigs have... Uh, impacted pretty much all of uh, the contiguous United States and Hawaii, and there's limited resources at both the state and federal level. So we're not talking about uh, overnight control and therefore an overnight um, amassing of carcasses. Uh, what we would talk about is at, at a much smaller scale, um, where where toxin deployments are going on, but those things would certainly need to be considered. Um, transport of the uh, residual sodium nitrite from the carcass into the soil and or environment would be considered. Um, there would certainly be information needed as to whether or not we could simply uh, uh, cover those animals to make them uh, mechanically inaccessible to non-targets. Um, th there's potential for all kinds of things. You know, there could be label recommendations uh, to remove the carcasses from the landscape and incinerate them. All of that will be part of the EPA uh, labeling process. Okay, does the, the bait itself, does it have its own flavor or do you put it out with something like corn as an effect? Um, the bait is pre-flavored um, and it has uh, held up well um, relative to uh, consumption of corn. Um, so you might certainly use corn um, to attract animals and then transition them transition them from corn to a non-toxic version of the bait and then ultimately to a toxic version of the bait. However, you have to recognize that we're still looking into that. Part of this effort here, here is to make feral swine control cost effective. And so there's going to be limitations on all of those things. Um, but but corn would certainly be a good attractant. Do you anticipate any challenges from natural food resources relating to sodium nitrate consumption in field trials? Can you restate that question for me, please? Um, 
Let me ask Mark if you're still on, if you would uh, resubmit that question. Let me, let me skip to the next one. Um, Uh, let's see, why not put it out in something like spooled corn that has been soaked in diesel? Uh, wouldn't that prevent other animals from eating it? Um, it, it may or may not. Um, there, there's certainly information out there, uh, both uh, anecdotal and I believe um, some quantifiable evidence about uh, the deterrence of non-targets using diesel. But uh, in terms of the potency and efficacy of sodium nitrite, uh, I wouldn't do it because it's such a reactive substance and it's going to be very difficult um, to make it um, stable, effective, and also to even be uh, taken up. Um, diesel fuel is, is very, very, very viscous, or is it not very, it's very liquid. Uh, and, and essentially what you would do is just uh, disperse sodium nitrite right into the ground. Um, moreover, we don't want to be pouring sodium nit or excuse me, diesel fuel uh, onto the ground um, without a certainly a certain more justification than we have to do so. Is the, the pork from the inspired animals, is it suitable for human consumption? Um, I, I wouldn't make that statement uh, to the public yet. Um, those, that type of question will be answered. We already have information towards that question, um, but I would, I would not go that far yet. I would tell you that all of the tissues um, that we have assessed, uh, the nitrite levels within them are, are well below the amount of sodium nitrite in bacon. Um, and that's all tissues excluding the stomach tissue and contents of the stomach. Um, should I or, or can an individual reach out to their local USDA office to offer their property as a potential test site? Uh, you, you certainly may do so. Um, and, and you would want to you would want to discuss that with um, the National Wildlife Research Center. Um, I would uh, also just tell you that there there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of folks uh, that have made that off offer. And were sodium nitrite uh, safe um, to to deploy on? On your property, um, having that actually done might be like winning the lottery. Okay. Um, a clarification on the previous question that we that we skipped over. Swan focus on seasonally abundant food resources. How will their seasonal selectivity impact their willingness to accept sodium nitrite? For example, when acorns are in or on the ground, will it be a challenge to get them to uh, to get them on the bait? That, that's a great question, um, and the answer is you bet. The resources that are available, and especially the preferred resources, are going to affect bait acceptance and, and therefore level of control. Um, we have not evaluated uh, those, those things um, in depth. Uh, or specifically in terms of a certain resource, uh, namely because by all accounts we know that it's going to happen. Uh, availability of resources is, is going to affect the use of other resources. And also the range that uh, uh, feral pigs exist in is so diverse in, to, in terms of food sources we cannot evaluate all of them. So. Uh, my response um, to you right now would be that I absolutely would not treat feral pigs uh, with a toxicant when conditions are favorable to the pigs. And 
the only thing that I, I think we can really go on now, and it, it certainly needs to be quantified and documented, um, regardless of how much all of us, certainly as, as Texans and, and feral pig control practitioners already know, uh, sometimes of the year are, are good um, for capturing feral pigs, and sometimes they're not. And capturing feral pigs um, in any kind of a trap it is certainly a function of the acceptance of not only the bait, but also uh, the capture mechanism. The, condi the, the case is the same uh, for delivering a bait, and I would not deploy baits at a time of the year when I couldn't capture feral pigs uh, as opportunist or no, optimally. Um. There's a question that just came in uh, on those lines. If I understand correctly, this requires using a special feeder and pre-baiting. Is it more time and cost effective than using corral traps? Um, I, I cannot, uh, well, I have no knowledge of, you know, empirical evidence that, that compares the two um in the case of an actual deployment i certainly have knowledge of uh simulated uh comparisons where poisons were indeed uh deployed on the landscape uh on, on an island and the authors of that work came back and, and said that uh Toxicant deployment is much more uh, cost effective and, and time effective in that case. However, every situation is going to be different, uh, and, and therefore, I do not advocate uh, the use of a pesticide as the only tool in the control box, uh, or, or the only method. You know, we're going to continue. Um, globally to need to use every tool we have available to us and, and in my opinion we're going to need to continue to develop new tools. The the next question uh, again talking about tools for management what methods of feral pig management do you recommend pending development of poison uh, and before you answer I would like to add that I'm going to put up three different links. Uh, two of them are for past webinars on wild pigs. One of them is a link to uh, AgriLife's feral hog page. Uh, and so as you answer that, Justin, I'm going to put those links up for anybody who wants to read or listen more on it. Okay. Well, uh, I again, I reiterate, I would use whichever tool is, is uh, effective and uh, readily available to you and cost effective and you've really got to take into consideration um, the amount of loss you're having you know if it's a fifty thousand dollar a night crop loss uh, then you're probably going to really uh, consider or find uh, ex more expensive methodologies as justifiable um, and and your impact may be greater. So uh, I'm not here to tout any one method. I believe that all of them are required, and and I'll I'll go as far as to say that I think helicopters are a great tool, uh, box traps are a great tool, corral traps are a great tool, uh, wireless traps are a great tool. Even dogs can be important um, in. in uh, seeking out those last remaining pigs on a property. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that feral pigs are expanding their range and numbers um, across North America, and our contemporary methods are not effective at reducing or even stabilizing that spread. With regards to the toxic who would who would the product be marketed to and how will sales be regulated? The concern uh, expressed is about domestic animals and if 
a neighboring property use this improperly, how could that negatively affect a domestic animal? Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think we've addressed uh, some of that here, and, and that's uh, in, in the delivery method. Um, our, our method, in terms of the devices used, needs to exclude um, things like livestock. When it is incapable of doing so, um, the prescription for deployment needs to consider that there's livestock on the range, and thus um, the recommendation may be that, look, you, you cannot deploy this stuff um, in areas where livestock species X are frequenting, um, and, and so we don't do that, you know. Um, much of that will come later on um, in, in the labeling uh, of the product, and it will be done um, in the training uh, of applicators, I would say. Um, so, and then uh, ultimately the landowner or, or land manager, you know, is going to have a say so uh, in where that stuff is deployed. But um, if we've ruled out non targets uh, and secondary consumption, um, and we have uh, developed a feeder that is indeed reliable for target specific delivery, there should not be too much of a concern um, about livestock picking it up. Um, in terms of who it will be marketed to, um, that, that, that is not my place uh, to speak. Um, it's very likely that uh, Texas Park Parks and Wildlife Department will have no say so in that whatsoever, um, other than being a consultant uh, to um, the US EPA with uh, information on natural resources, flora and fauna, and, and the results of our work uh, with our collaborators. Uh, I should I should interject. I should interject there that uh, if it's a limited use pesticide, um, you know, we're, we're not talking about broad scale marketing of sorts. Um, and, and I'm not a marketing professional, um, nor am I a regulated pesticide uh, applicator or, or salesman. Um, so I don't fully understand that yet, but it's certainly not going to be marketed where, hey, everybody come get some off the shelf. Um, I'll give you an example of what I saw when I was in Australia is that licensed applicators held meetings where landowners came out and uh, they were very aware of, of uh, the availability of the product to them, how it was to be used under the care of the applicator. Uh, what types of uh, notices were required to be posted and things of that nature. And I would view that to be part of what the EPA uh, would require. Has the, the cost of the pesticide been looked into any? Um, it, 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 certainly, it certainly has. I can't give you an end cost for the product. Um, but just looking uh, at, at some of the work we've done here, um, I think we will be able to um, drop the cost per pig taken uh, significantly with sodium nitrite. Um, it's globally available. It's very cheap. Um, our prototype versions of active ingredients are very expensive. and. Even with that, uh, you know, we're able to do it for less than four or five bucks a pig. 